time. You were in stage? Yeah, he had oh. gone abroad. <laughs> And as of North America returned. Why did you come here? Ma'am, the live has been started right now. Started? Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we are waiting for a couple of minutes in case more people join, and then we will start. Nishima joined? Not yet. So, Mahipal ji, can you please make sure if Dr. Ramendra Sundar Day INST has joined? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yes. yeah, good morning. Good morning, good morning, Dr. Day. And Manoj Raji. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he has joined. He joined 10 minutes early. Okay. Welcome, Dr. Raji. Hi, Manoj. Ah, hello, good morning. Good morning, Manoj. Good morning. Good morning. So, Kaya, I think Nishima will not be able to join. She is traveling. Okay. Also, IAPT has another lecture today. Yeah, yeah at 11 a.m. on the yeah. Nobel Prize in Physics. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, maybe another chapter has arranged it. But yeah. Huh? Because IIPT has some 50 odd chapters in the academy. Right. Yes. So, so maybe I think you can, yeah. So maybe you can start because uh, people can join while we are uh, through the preliminaries. So I welcome you all today to this morning's lecture. Good morning, everybody. This lecture, the fourth lecture, in our Nobel Prize series this year is the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. This is being organized by SPSTI, the Society for Promotion of Science and Technology in India, of which I'm the General Secretary. We are organizing this in association with Indian Association for Physics Teachers, Punjab State Council for Science and Technology, and Chandigarh chapters of NASI, INSA, and INYAS. Professor Partho Mojumdar, it is an honor to have you on our forum today. Dr. Girish Sani, thank you for joining us again. And we also welcome Dr. Manoj Raje, Dr. Ramendra Shundar De, and my old friend, Professor Somdatta. Somdatta Sina, who was in Aisar Mohali. So welcome all of you. Today's topic, on ancient DNA is very exciting. Professor Grover has already circulated a copy of your article, Professor Mojumdar, and we are eager to learn more. So I now request Mr. Dharamvir to extend a formal welcome. Uh, it's a privilege to welcome Professor Mojumdar. Uh, very distinguished after which we are contribution to Indian science and internationally and on a national scale. I'm really privileged that we have you today deliver a lecture on a very interesting topic. And as we moved, we embraced and absorbed. I think Indian science has come of age with the experts and scientists of your 
Stitcher. Mm -hmm. You have led so many initiatives which made it happen. I also welcome Professor Girish Thani, another distinguished scientist of India, formal director general, CSIR, <laughs> director MTEC, one of the foremost laboratory of our country, and currently honorary professor Punjab University. We have had the privilege of patronage of Professor Sahani in, in earlier years, and we too look forward for his association with our society, as well as guidance uh, to take it further. The topic of the day, the citation, uh, the Noel Prize in Physiology and Medicine is very exciting. We have had some discussion among us ourselves. And uh, once again, I welcome Professor Majumdar, Professor Girish Thani, and thank Professor Arun Grover for conducting this session. Thank you. Um, I now request Professor Grover to present his opening remarks. Professor Good Grover. morning. Good morning, all. I am particularly delighted to welcome all of you to today's expository lecture on Nobel Prize in Medicine being delivered by Professor Partha Mojamdar. The audience on our online platform, where we are continuing to commemorate the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav in the second year, are familiar with today's speaker as well as our guest of honor, Dr. Girish Sani. Both of them had delivered expository lectures in the part one of our series on institution building and nurture initiatives in independent India. Dr. Sani had described to us the story of CSIR institutions and their contemporary role in promoting innovations for national development on the birth date of Bhatnagar, that is February 21, 2022. Just about six months ago, on May 7, 2022, Mr. Partha had told us the story of Dr. P.C. Manalobis, the architect of statistical science and our national development. The statistical, Indian Statistical Institute was founded by Manalobis in 1932. Partha is an emeritus professor at ISI today. It is serendipity that Manalobis and Bhatnaga were contemporaries both born within eight months of each other in 1893 and 1894. We remember Manalobis on his birthday, National Statistics Day on June 29, and Bhatnagar on the CSR Foundation Day, September 26. As soon as this year's Nobel Prize for Medicine was announced, I started to receive suggestions from PU faculty that we should request Partha to enlighten us on the path-breaking discoveries of Savante Pabo concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. I had immediately contacted Partha and he very graciously accepted our request. And on behalf of SPSTI, Chandigarh Chapters of Science Academies, India's, I wish to thank Partha for his gesture. Our speaker is the founder of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, which is a national research institute operating under the Department of Biotechnology. Dr. Grish Sahani, our guest of honor, has served as the director of CSR Institute of Microbial Te Technology in Chandigarh for over 10 years. They know each other very well. I have no hesitation in stating that I use the occasion of few minutes of my address before every expository lecture to enhance my personal knowledge base by browsing through the internet on matters relating to, or the, to the speaker or his topic. One of the tallest living statistical science persons globally is Professor C.R. Rao, who was born on September 10, 1920. His centenary year was celebrated by mathematicians and statisticians internationally during the COVID pandemic. C.R. Rao had trained under P.C. Manalobis at ISI Calcutta and had received his PhD in 1945. Immediately after the Second World War, the Department of Anthropology of Cambridge University had sent a request to Manalobis to send an expert to analyze measurements made on human skeletons brought from 
Jebel Maya in North Africa to the Cambridge University's Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. It was aimed to trace the origin of people who lived there using the method of Mahanalobi's D-square statistics. Mahanalobi sent C.R. Rao to Cambridge and C.R. Rao worked at Cambridge for two years and developed new methods of analysis of multiple measurements and used them to analyze the data. He was awarded another PhD thesis in 1948 by the University of Cambridge for multivariate analysis of variance acronyms as MANOVA. 26 years later, the Cambridge University also awarded him DST degree in 1974. Partha must have had the privilege of having been taught by C.R. Rao at ISI during his bachelor's and master's degree in 1970s at ISI. C.R. Rao had left USA after his supervision from ISI in 1980. So I might, if my guess is, I think correct, that Partho must have had the privilege of having C.R. Rao as his teacher during his graduation and post-graduation days. So with this, I conclude my brief address. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kia. Thank you, Professor Grover. I now request Dr. Manoj Raji. Dr. Raji is from Intech in Chandigarh. Dr. Raji, please introduce today's guest of honor, Dr. Girish Sani. Good morning. Uh, respected Professor Majumdar, uh, Dr. Sahani, Professor Grover, and my esteemed colleagues. It's a privilege for me to introduce our guest of honor, Dr. Girish Sani, with whom I have had an over three decades association. Uh, Dr. Sani actually requires no introduction to this audience. However, for those of you who may not be aware, Dr. Sani did his bachelor's and master's from Punjab University, Chandigarh, passing out in 1978, and followed this up with a PhD from ISC Bangalore in 1984. Between 1984 and 1986, he carried out postdoctoral research and training at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and at the Rockefeller University, New York. In 1986, he was appointed as an adjunct faculty at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, New York. And he completed his research in the United States in 1991, and then subsequently returned to India as a senior scientist at the Institute of Microbial Technology. Uh, this was about just at the same time when I was joining the institute. And in this institute, he established his research group with a focus on protein engineering. In 2005, he was appointed as director CSIR Imtech and undertook modernization and reorientation of the institute. Subsequently, when he took over as director general of CSIR and secretary to the government of India and the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, he carried forward his ideas and scientific endeavors to redirect the research output of CSIR. Dr. Sani has made seminal contributions in the area of protein cardiovascular drugs, especially clot busters and their mode of action. He has published his discoveries in numerous prestigious international journals. However, as he has always emphasized on taking his research from petri dishes to pilot plants and onto society, and towards achieving this goal, he filed numerous patents and developed many technologies. He has led teams responsible for producing technology for India's first indigenous clot buster recombinant streptokinase. This has been produced by Sasun Drugs Chennai and marketed under the brand name Clot Buster. And this single achievement, one single achievement of Dr. Sani was responsible for making clot busters affordable to even to all and sundry in the country. Otherwise, earlier before this, it was very difficult for an average middle class person to obtain the clot buster therapy, which was necessary in case of arterial diseases. He also developed India's first novel biotherapeutic molecule, which was the clot specific streptokinase. This has been patented worldwide and licensed to a US pharmaceutical company. His research also led to the development of fourth generation antithrombolytic clot busters that have been patient, uh, patented and outlicensed. 
Professor Sani is a fellow of all the national academies, a member of the Goa Research Conference, and has been awarded with numerous prestigious awards, including for to name a few National Biotechnology Product Development Award way back in 2002, CSI Technology Shield, the Vaswik Industrial Award, Randaxi Award in Pharmaceutical Sciences, Vigyan Ratan Award, Sri Om Prakash Basin Award, the National Intellectual Property Award, and the Bhatnagar Fellowship, to name a few. On a personal note, I have always found him to be a sensitive and helpful individual who has always found time to mentor younger colleagues and encourage scientists from the weaker section of society and especially women scientists. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank him for providing stellar direction to India's younger scientists who have been always trying to take their research from the laboratory into a, to pr make products and pay, uh, products which are useful for society at large. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Monolds, uh, for that enlightening introduction. And now I request Dr. Sani to start. Dr. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I am privileged to be here. It's an honor and a great uh, mood builder, uh, especially if you have your young colleagues describe your small achievements in a very magnified way. Thank you, Manoj, for a very gratifying introduction. Professor Majumdar, <clears throat> Dr. Grover, Dharampal ji, Kea ji, all the distinguished people who have joined this particular event, which is turning out to be something very, very attractive. Every lecture is followed keenly, not only in real time, but subsequently from the net. It's a great achievement. And I congratulate the people who dreamt of it and made it a reality. Today's talk, I will not stand very much between the main speaker, who is a, one of the most distinguished molecular biologists and <clears throat> long picture evaluator of science. Many scientists are small picture detail gatherers, nothing wrong with it. I belong to that category, but there are very few people who actually take the long view and realize the big picture. Today's speaker is one of those. As was Darwin, let us remember him today because nothing in biology finds its perspective unless looked through the telescope or biscope of evolution. As a microbiologist, I have been fortunate to see evolution, if not in a test tube, at least in a flask or a fermentation vessel. You can actually use Darwinian principles and see them operate in a matter of days to months, but not the evolution of species, the evolution of vertebrates, etc., that has happened in millennia, millions of years actually. And today's talk is an excellent example where the molecular footprints, as you see in bacteria, the same kind of footprints when they happen in human in humans or their progenitor humanoids or other uh, group of evolving human and advanced apes, you see their molecular footprints being chased after millions of years, literally, to very smart science. Not only the Darwinian fundamental principles, but the techniques of extracting DNA, using them, despite the fact that they are highly degraded, as this Nobel Prize has illustrated, and myriad other windows that would open up as a result of this discovery and its appreciation by the scientific community. I think generally people think that molecular paleontology is an exotic discipline, which is out of the sphere of most laboratories. I was fortunate to know and still know Professor Ashok Sani and early in my career, I used to visit his lab and have discussions and used to talk about dreamily about dinosaurs. And then this Jurassic Park movie came and opened up our vistas further. Today, I think in this talk that we will listen and many students will also listen. One thing will come out, I'm sure, is how science not only goes into the future, but goes into the deep past 
and brings great insights. So I will not stand too much between uh, the speaker and my thoughts, which I, I can keep on rambling, but uh, I look forward very excitedly to today's lecture and uh, all the best to this uh, lecture series, all its participants and all the students, because from the student point of view, if I were listening to this lecture, let's say 40 years ago, it would have opened many windows in small little closed windows in young minds because how discoveries are made are more important than the litany of facts that we see in our curriculum. Unfortunately, in our country, in many other countries, absorption of facts, digestion, quasi-digestion, and examination has become the norm. But when you have speakers like Partha, or you dwell, <clears throat> when, you, when you actually look at how the scientific discovery was made, it makes more scientists. It opens the doors of portals of curiosity and everything else follows automatically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sani, for pointing that out. I'm very glad that you did. And now I request Professor Shomdatta Sinha to introduce today's speaker. Shomdatta, please. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's I'm visiting Mohali at this point as a young professor of Faisal Mohali. I'm also uh, an honorary scientist at uh, Isa Kolkata. It's both a privilege and pleasure to participate in this program. Thank you, Professor Grover and other organizers for uh, calling me into it. I, I do attend sometimes at this, this, these programs of this organization from Kolkata also. It's a pleasure because I'm asked to introduce Professor Partha Majumdar, who, is a, who has been a good friend for decades. It's a privilege to be part of this program because SPSTI is a unique organization which is promoting science and technology in the society silently for a very long time. Well, it's as others also said, it's a privilege to introduce Professor Partha Pratim Majumdar, commonly known as Partha Majumdar or just PPM to his students. Uh, not only because he is an outstanding scientist in his area of research, but also because, as others have pointed out, he has built a unique research institute, National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, which has no parallel in India. He's a great mentor and teacher, and above all, he's an excellent science communicator. His articles in Bengali and English are lucid and covers comes out in newspapers every other day. Um, it's, they are both lucid and covers contemporary issues in science, including policy, controversial policy, policy issues about which he has always taken a stand. Uh, given the time constraint, let me just read out a short version of his achievements. Um, I have to read it out because there are so many of them, uh, just as for others uh, who are present here. So Partha Jumdar is a national science chair of the government of India. And those of you who know what a national science chair is, you would know that there are less than 10 people right now in India who are national science chairs. He's founded, as mentioned earlier, the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics in India, which is a unique place unless you visit and go through what they have. It probably has one of the best um, facilities of genome sequences with the latest uh, instruments that are available today. And you should see that hall where all the computers and sequencing facility is there. Everything set up by Partha and his team, of course. <laughs> He's a distinguished professor in the, in, at NIBMG and also an emeritus professor of the Indian Statistical Institute from where he did his BSTAT, MSTAT and PhD. And at that point, probably people thought he's just a statistician. And today people think he's a biologist. He's made profound contrib contributions to understanding ancestries and structures of ethnic populations of Asia, in India in particular, using molecular genetic and statistical methods. And this is one area where both theory and experiments go hand in hand. You can't just do the experimental and sequence the DNA and think that you've got the results unless you use as advanced statistical methods and maybe develop new statistical methods. 
Very few people think like that. He has also contributed to deciphering the genetic basis of many diseases, including cancers, which are of high prevalence in India. I've been in the uh, uh, research council and if you hear his colleagues presenting, you would get an, some idea about how, how many areas they are working in. He served as the president of Indian Academy of Sciences of the, and of the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology at a very crucial time uh, uh, for IAS during the COVID-19, uh, when COVID-19 was raging all over the world. He serves on the organizing committee of many international um, programs, such as of the Human Cell Atlas and the International Common Disease Alliance. He's a co-chair of the equity working group of the Human Cell Atlas. These are huge programs involving countries from all over the world. And from India, he's the one who uh, represents us. Well, he's an, obviously he's an elected uh, um, a fellow of all the science academies and also the World Academy of Sciences uh, uh, and the International Statistical Institute. Um, recipient of many awards, many of them were repeated for uh, Dr. Grish Sahani, but some of them I'll men mention here. He got the biology, he received the biology prize of the World Academy of Sciences, GN Ramchandran Medal of the CSIR, Sir Prophila Chandra Ray Memorial Award Medal of the University of Calcutta, the Golden Jubilee Commemoration Medal of the INSA, and the New Millennium Science Medal of the Government of India. I think this is just a small uh, uh, kind of representation of what all he has done and has achieved. If any of you would like to read more, please go to the internet and see. Never go to Wikipedia and look for uh, uh, Professor uh, or Partha Pratim Majumdar because you will read somewhere completely different, which is not our own BPM. Thank you very much. And, and I hope you like that. Thank you, Somdatta. Thank you, Professor Somdatta Sinha for that very interesting introduction. Thank you. And now I request Professor Partha Majumdar to start his address. Professor Majumdar, please. We're waiting for your lecture. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm uh, actually very uh, privileged and honored uh, to be called upon uh, for a repeat uh, lecture in this particular um, series of programs that you have organized. Uh, it's really wonderful to be back. And uh, I'm actually humbled uh, that there are so many luminaries um, in the audience today um, that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also my feet are trembling as a matter of fact. Um, but it's always a pleasure. Uh, want to also make the you know make uh, begin my talk with a slight small remark that indeed uh, when I was in the studying the join had joined the BSTAT uh, the Bachelor of Statistics program at the Indian Statistical Institute we were taught by uh, C R Rao but he soon thereafter left for the U S well he initially left for Delhi spent a few years in I S I Delhi and then left for the U S. I've also had the privilege of uh, being a colleague of his at the University of Pittsburgh when I joined on the faculty in 1987. And uh, I joined the Department of Biostatistics and he was uh, in the Department of Statistics. So, and these were adjacent buildings as a matter of fact. So I've had the privilege of um, not, not writing a paper with him, but uh, you know, uh, gained a lot from uh, his thoughts and his contributions to uh, the field of statistical science and that that uh, really has stood me in good stead and as of today i'm actually writing a short biography of cr rao on um, because the isi had organized uh, a series of um, again lectures on luminaries from isi and i had given the talk on uh, professor cr rao and therefore uh, i've been asked to write this biography i've written short biographies of uh, cr rao uh, earlier uh, also had organized one in honor of him on his uh, 100th birthday. He's 102 today. Uh, in the Indian Academy of Sciences, I'd organized a major symposium um, in honor of his uh, birth centenary uh, a, few, a couple of years ago. All right. So I will uh, begin my talk. And essentially, uh, as, as you can see that I've titled my talk and, uh, as, and as we have moved, we embraced and absorbed. Many people have found this um, title very intriguing, 
and because it's it's not it doesn't reveal what is coming but i hope that i'll be able to justify uh, why i have titled my talk um, as i have um, also i'm going to like professor sahani said that i'm actually going to um, uh, you know straddle across uh, several uh, million years but of course i'm very quickly going to come to the humans uh, i'm actually going to trace uh, the human line of descent in evolution and very quickly home into the uh, humans and try and uh, find out what uh, Savante Bebo has done, um, for which he's been uh, given the Nobel Prize. Um, so he's, uh, he's uh, just, just give me a second, I need to get rid of this bar. I don't know how to get rid of this bar. Just give me a second, please. Uh, this is, no. mm -hmm. anyway, um, actually I can't see my, uh, the uh, uh, Savante Pebo was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, and this Nobel citation states that he was awarded the Nobel Prize for his discoveries concerning the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution. So that's essentially what I'm going to talk to you about. But, uh, uh, you know, if I just talk about uh, Savante's contributions, it doesn't put his contributions in the perspective of human evolution. So I decided that I will provide a narrative and the contextualization of the work that uh, Savante has done. Um, incidentally, I've had the privilege of actually knowing Savante personally. Uh, had he uh, not won the Nobel Prize this year, he would already be in India today. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, it's impossible to get him for <laughs> a few more years, uh, particularly because he has to um, you know, travel uh, to many places on behalf of the Nobel Foundation. Um, okay, so well, let me let me move on. And like I said, that I'm going to uh, cover many millions of years of evolution, but primarily human evolution. Um, so if we uh, look at uh, evolution, our story will begin about uh, five to ten million years ago. And what happened about uh, well, all of these. Let me warn you that all of these uh, dates that I will provide will be uh, a large uh, will um, you know bracket a large period of time. So I said that our story begins five to 10 million years ago. That's a five million year bracket, but that's what it is because uh, the kind of evidence from which we um, estimate these dates is fragmentary and you can't uh, provide a point estimate of the date. Uh, so it's usually a large bracket of time, but uh, roughly about 8 million years ago is what the, if you are uh, insisting on a point estimate, roughly about 8 million years ago, uh, something very interesting happened. Uh, we were all apes. There were lots of Af uh, apes in Africa, and these apes split into two distinct species. One of those um, uh, led to one of those species led to the humans, and that's called the hominid line of descent. The other um, uh, line of descent is, uh, uh, you know, provided the evolution of newer kinds of apes, such as the gorillas, chimpanzees, and more recently the bonobos. So uh, about 8 million years ago, all of us had the same ancestor. We were roaming around in the streets of Africa or in the forests of Africa. And then for whatever reason, we don't know for sure, but certainly there are genetical reasons uh, and physiological reasons and anatomical reasons for um, this particular speciation event to have happened uh, sometime between 5 and 10 million years ago. Uh, I'm primarily, of course, going to um, focus on the hominid line of descent that eventually led to the evolution of modern humans. Let me jump uh, uh, a million years or so and uh, uh, say that uh, about four million years ago, another major uh, event had happened uh, in the history of evolution. Um, one of those species that uh, that bifurcated and led to the uh, and and was uh, climbing down the evolutionary path that led to modern humans, uh, they began spending most of its time on two feet. As we know that uh, you know most of the apes uh, are uh, quadrupedal and we are bipedal. Modern humans are bipedal, but uh, bipedality arose about uh, eight million years ago. Uh, again, uh, there are uh, you know fragmentary evidence about our bipedality, but one of the best evidence comes from um, what uh, you know our ancestors have left on a uh, volcanic ash bed. So this is a volcanic ash bed in Kenya. Uh, it was probably uh, not completely hot, but reasonably warm uh, when uh, one of our ancestors walked on that volcanic ro rock bed. And it, since it was still uh, soft, 
uh, those those uh, footprints uh, lay, uh, you know those fruit footprints uh, were preserved on the volcanic ash bed and after the ash bed cooled um, then essentially uh, those footprints remain uh, have remained for uh, you know millennia um, so this rock bed has been aged to, has been the age of this rock bed is about 3.7 million years and since uh, the footprints have been preserved the uh, guess is that whoever walked on this uh, rock bed had walked on it uh, even before the rock bed had cooled so the best estimate of time would be little over uh, 7 point, uh, 3.7 million years. That's consistent with the fragmentary fossil evidence that we have that we became uh, bipedal about 4 million years ago. This uh, uh, volcanic uh, ash bed and the footprints, um, of course, I can't read those footprints. I'm not trained. But people who are trained, such as Mary Leakey, and uh, um, all of you would know this uh, name, the, the family name Leakey, the family, that particular family spent generations uh, in, um, in Africa uh, uh, excavating fossils and drawing inferences from fossils, etc., recreating human evolution, essentially using fossil evidence. So Mary Leakey, who is, um, you know, trained to read these kinds of footprints, um, has uh, vouched that whoever walked on this rock bed uh, had a bipedal gait. Um, it's quite, uh, quite obvious that it's not quadrupedal, but... Uh, you know, again, these kinds of things need some amount of training. So essentially about 4 million years ago, we became bipedal. And that bipedality actually led to concomitant uh, physiological and anatomical changes. Uh, I don't have the uh, really the time to uh, discuss, describe all of those anatomical changes that, uh, uh, you know, uh, led that that was concomitant or soon followed soon after we became um, bipedal. Um, so, uh, again, I'm going to jump two million years and come to uh, the origins of the genus Homo. Um, and in the origin of uh, in the genus Homo, the uh, earliest species are called uh, Erectus, Homo erectus, or uh, Homo ergaster. And of course, they were bipedal. This is about uh, two, two million years ago. Uh, the characteristic feature of Homo erectus or Homo ergaster was that um, they could use tools, they could make uh, tools and use the uh, tools, of course, the, uh, they were uh, stone tools, uh, essentially, um, uh, the, but they, they actually shaped these, uh, shaped the stones in order to uh, uh, shape the stones in order to, um, uh, you know, uh, use them to, particularly to ward off predators. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that, that's what uh, Homo erectus did. And Homo erectus also traveled widely. This is, uh, they, they arose in Africa, but uh, about, uh, you know, Homo erectus fossils, uh, about uh, 1.8 million years, that, that's been dated to about 1.8 million years ago, have been also found in Java. So one of the conclusions is that Homo erectus, uh, um, after, uh, you know, we became bipedal about 2 million years ago, uh, we um, evolved uh, Homo erectus, but they also became quite mobile uh, as a result of which, um, uh, you know, we find uh, these fossils in Africa as also in Java. For a long period of time, there was a, a raging battle within the field of evolution uh, because of these kinds of findings that, you know, you found the same species in Africa and also in Java, Java separated by um, a few thousand years. Uh, would that mean that there was simultaneous evolution of humans uh, in different geographical regions? Uh, that debate persisted for a very long period of time, but that has actually, um, you know, the, the, the ultimate uh, uh, result of that particular discussion or debate uh, is that we, uh, we evolved uniregionally in Africa, uh, like many other species, and why Africa was um, the hotbed of evolution, nobody would be able to answer that. But the fact remains that a lot of species have actually evolved in Africa. Um, oops, what's going on? Um, so, um, you know, Homo erectus arose about 2 million years ago, and then there was a very rapid evolution of our species. Um, uh, once the first members in this uh, species in the genus Homo appeared, um, we started to spin off new varieties of Homo, and these varieties are called uh, species. They're called uh, Homo habilis, uh, Homo ergaster, erectus. I've talked about uh, the Heidelberg man, Homo heidelbergensis, uh, Neanderthal man, Homo neanderthalensis, 
uh, and of course us uh, modern humans homo sapiens and we are uh, we arose about uh, 150,000 years ago or so again in africa um, there are now 21 known species of humans and uh, this is this is essentially a phylogenetic tree uh, essentially a tree um, uh, that describes the relationships among the various species of um, humans and various other species of primates and as uh, uh, essentially uh, the the root is here and that's the oldest because that's the root of this phylogenetic tree that's the root of this tree and uh, we are all here and there are today 21 known species of humans perhaps there were more species of humans um, um, as evidenced by the fact that uh, you know, a species such as Homo long, uh, long, longi has only been identified uh, uh, three years ago, four years ago. So we are still discovering new species of Homo, um, but there, uh, but at, at least there are twenty-one known species that uh, that uh, you know uh, existed at that time. Um, again, I jump uh, a, a large period of time and come to uh, evolution of modern humans. And there are three key points that I want to make here. Um, like I said that, you know, Homo erectus was, is at the base and Homo erectus gave rise to various other species. Um, but uh, um, the, the major point that I want to make, which is pertinent to this year's uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine, uh, the Heidelberg man, Homo heidelbergensis, um, and the Homo heidelbergensis almost looked like us, as you can see, us meaning the modern humans, uh, but they were not modern humans. From there, that was the, that was the particular branch that led to modern humans uh, about 150,000 years ago, also led to uh, the evolution of two other species, uh, the Neanderthal man and the Denisovans, who don't exist anymore. Uh, they, they are all, they've all vanished. So uh, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans, Denisovans you may or may not have heard, but I'll introduce uh, you to the Denisovans uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But uh, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans don't exist anymore. Um, so the question that uh, was raging in the minds of evolutionary biologists or human evolutionary biologists was, why did the Neanderthals and Denisovans uh, vanish, become extinct? Uh, did the modern humans kill the Denisovans and the Neanderthals? Or uh, what happened? Was there a natural calamity? If there was a natural calamity, how did the hum modern humans survive? So all of these kinds of um, uh, you know, debate uh, and, and speculations were going on um, until uh, you know, Sivante Pebo came to the scene and he essentially resolved this uh, debate that was uh, you know, raging for a long period of time. It was not easy to resolve that debate and uh, I will have uh, two or three very technical um, kinds of uh, you know, technical slides describing some technical points, uh, which, was actually, which is actually uh, deep contributions, deep technical contributions made by um, Cervante. In addition to addressing this question that was um, skirted uh, primarily because technologies were not available that were uh, skirted by many uh, human evolutionary biologists. So um, let me let me now introduce you to the DNA. All of you probably know, and I'm pretty sure that all of you know. Um, Can you go to presentation mode, please? Oh, yeah. So how did it not? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, how did it get to this mode? I don't know. Okay. Um, so um, thank you. Thank you, Zondata. Um, uh, the, um, let me introduce you to uh, the DNA, particularly if there are some students who are listening, uh, who, are, who don't belong to this, uh, you know, this particular domain. Uh, the human DNA has about 3 billion nucleotides. So it's a linear string of 3 billion alphabet that makes up our DNA, which uh, is really the code for uh, much of our uh, physical traits, physical characteristics, uh, and also much of, our, much of the uh, human behavior. Um, these, uh, the, the DNA molecules are passed on uh, to, from one generation to another, 50% um, uh, of which will be passed on by the mother, the remaining 50% by the father. Um, and uh, essentially the DNA molecules, if you look at, uh, if you sample DNA molecules from a bunch of us, from a bunch of modern humans, they will be largely similar. As a matter of fact, they'll be 99.9% .9 similar alphabet by alphabet. So there's about a 0.1% difference, but this 0.1% difference is a difference of about 3 million nucleotides. And this difference 
uh, provides uh, the different characteristic features that we have that 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 are personal to us, the way that we behave, the uh, diseases that we become susceptible to, etc. So these three million nucleotides, on an average, uh, control all of these various kinds of um, uh, phenomena or, or features. Um, there are uh, how do these differences arise if we are uh, going to inherit from our parents then and and if there is continuity of the dna in the uh, uh, time scale of evolution how do these uh, variations arise there should not be any variation if we go back to the mythical adam and eve uh, they must have um, had some dna that were identical and should have passed on to future generations and that particular dna should have remained but how then uh, do these differences arise um, these differences arise in one of two ways. One is that we expose ourselves to various kinds of environmental factors, including the rays of the sun, including you know, man-made external factors such as tobacco smoke that actually uh, impacts on changing the DNA. Uh, the ultraviolet rays of the sun impact on changing the DNA, etc. Most of these changes that happen because of exposure to these external forces will be corrected by biological mechanisms inherent in us, inbuilt in us. Sometimes the mechanisms fail and uh, uh, fail to correct these errors that have happened. And those, those kinds of errors then are passed on to the next generation. In the DNA, the errors that remain, the uh, erroneous points in the DNA are actually passed on to the next generation. And that's how um, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, differences accumulate and accumulated differences become larger and larger. Uh, the number of accumulated differences become larger and larger as time moves on, as generations pass by and uh, uh, human beings become more and more diverse. Um, when a large number of changes accumulate, uh, we accumulate these changes over a period of time. After a certain period of time, uh, a large number of uh, changes would have accumulated. And uh, then uh, that's when uh, a new species is born. Now, how large should be large, we still don't know. We grapple with that. Uh, and when the speciation happens, is just the accumulation of uh, uh, you know changes in the DNA lead to speciation? Probably not. There are many, many other features that lead to speciation. But today, I'm not giving a talk on speciation at all. Uh, uh, suffice it to say that these changes that accumulate uh, is one of the major features of new species evolving from a pre-existing species. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, by studying the DNA, by studying the nature of the DNA, the difference in the DNA, it's possible to infer which species evolved from which other species. Again, that's, that's uh, uh, te technically a challenge, but those technical challenges have actually been overcome using various kinds of, uh, you know, experimental, uh, but more importantly, statistical methods. Uh, and and not, not only uh, we can infer about uh, new species, which two species uh, are uh, distinct, we can also infer when did the speciation event happen. So we can actually um, uh, estimate the time as well uh, in terms of the speciation event. So this is all done by analyzing the DNA. And uh, uh, because bones, you know, in, in fossils, etc., have actually been derived from one individual and the individual um, uh, was dead by the time uh, she or he was fossilized. And then the vagaries of nature um, actually eroded most of that evidence and we are left with uh, a small fragment of a bone or a small fragment of a skull from which we need to uh, draw, uh, draw inferences. Therefore, the kind of inferences that are made uh, from fossil evidence as a large standard deviation. On the other hand, because of the continuity of DNA, if we are able to sample and analyze DNA for, from individuals who have lived in the past and compare their DNA with our DNA, with the modern DNA of the modern humans, we probably will be able to get uh, more, more, uh, uh, you know, more extensive data and uh, less fragmented data. So that's, that's what has been used and also um, you know, the, the understanding of how the DNA evolves, uh, especially in terms of calibration of time, um, has been much better than, um, than, than fossil evidence. But again, these are complementary pieces of evidence. The fossil evidence, paleontological evidence, and molecular evidence are uh, complementary pieces of evidence. You can infer a date based on molecular evidence, but you need to show that 
the fossils from fossil evidence that your molecular uh, estimates of time are actually uh, valid because we've been able to find uh, fossils uh, you know at that uh, uh, during that period of time and those fossils belong to two different species so the inference is made from the two um, uh, different domains of science the paleontological sciences and the genomic sciences uh, they must complement each other in order to draw full proof uh, inferences about uh, human evolution. So from now on, I'm not actually going to talk about paleontological evidence, uh, although I actually didn't give you too much of paleontological evidence, but those inferences about bipedality and so on and so forth were primarily based on paleontological evidence, fossil evidence. So from now on, I'm essentially going to talk about DNA evidence and uh, uh, bring you up to date when we may uh, infer some times uh, based on DNA evidence how does it corroborate with paleontological evidence so uh, as i move along i will provide that corroboration or um, uh, similarities between inferences based on paleontological science and genomic science all right so uh, like i said and i'm not going to address this question how do you know that we evolved in africa so i'm not going to address that question now it's uh, proven beyond uh, uh, any uh, any doubt uh, not not just reasonable doubt beyond any doubt based on multiple uh, kinds of evidence from different scientific domains uh, that we evolved in Africa. So if we evolved in Africa, and uh, so if those are the most ancient humans, uh, and like I said, that uh, errors accumulate, and because of these uh, errors, there are differences in the DNA. And so at some point of time, if you look at differences in DNA among a group of individuals, you would find diversity in the DNA. So uh, the, the uh, point is that uh, if you have populations, so if you have populations that evolved a long time ago, and if you are studying them in uh, contemporary times, you would find a large amount of diversity. Uh, we we use, use this logic, but turn the logic the other way around, which is to say that if we identify a group of individuals and find that there is a large amount of genetic diversity there, the inference is that those individuals, that group of individuals must have evolved earlier than another group of individuals that show lesser amount of DNA diversity. So that's the kind of logic that we use. And if we use that logic, number one, we f find, as you can see from this graph on the x-axis, is the extent of diversity. Uh, there are various measures of diversity. They are all correlated. Doesn't really matter which particular measure of diversity we use. This is based on DNA um, molecules or DNA uh, sequences. On the, um, the y-axis, you find that these sequences come from various kinds of uh, various geographical regions. And uh, the uh, one thing that's all absolutely clear is that uh, Africa has the highest amount of genetic diversity. And that's consistent with other uh, knowledge from other domains that uh, the oldest populations uh, belong to um, Africa. And uh, that's the expectation. And the inference from this uh, data is that uh, African populations are the oldest. Uh, we find that Asian populations um, are the second old, oldest, so to say, or uh, Asia harbors the second uh, largest amount of DNA diversity. Populations in Asia uh, harbor the second um, highest amount of DNA diversity, followed by other continents such as Europe, Australia, and so on and so forth. So uh, again, uh, we will remember this, that uh, Africa has the highest amount of genetic diversity followed by Asia, because this has um, uh, an implication in terms of our inferences based on DNA data. Uh, also, if you look at uh, other kinds of um, ways to measure uh, diversity, uh, the red is the African. These are among populations in Africa. As you can see, that that's uh, um, on the right side of the uh, um, x-axis, and therefore that diversity is higher than the blue diversity. The blue diversity are among populations outside of Africa. So uh, African populations are more diverse than populations elsewhere. Uh, the uh, corollary of that or the inference from that is that African populations are older than populations of other uh, geographies regions. If we uh, look uh, in various ways, uh, the same thing pans out, but this is a little bit more uh, revealing. Um, let me first explain what this is. So uh, in the humans, for various kinds of, um, if you analyze a lot number of DNA sequences, you can actually find signatures of DNA sequences. You can find groups of DNA molecules that carry a specific signature, and you can find different kinds of uh, different subsets of DNA molecules that carry distinct signatures. 
Uh, and so this, these are distinct signatures, A, B, C, D, E, et cetera. These are all distinct kinds of signatures. Um, uh, these signatures are based on uh, those points on the genome that are variable across individuals. Otherwise, obviously, you can't build a signature. If a point on the genome is uh, completely constant, uh, the alphabet is completely constant across individuals, that will not contribute to a signature. So what we are trying to do is to identify specific alphabets or specific constellations of alphabets that can provide um, a, a, a signature to a particular population or a group of populations. Uh, so these are uh, various signatures. And if you look at the distribution of these signatures, and we are now talking about signatures on the Y chromosome, which are uh, patternally inherited, the Y chromosome um, you know, is uh, transmitted by the father to the sons, uh, to his sons. Uh, and so we are looking at patternally transmitted uh, signatures. These are signatures on the Y chromosome. If we look at the distribution of uh, these signatures over geographical space, and I also want to <coughs> point out that as you move from left to right, the leftmost signatures are the oldest signatures. Again, how do we know that those are oldest? Using uh, a lot of data and statistical analysis of the data. So, and I don't have the time to explain the methodology. The ones on the left are the oldest and the ones on the right are the, uh, are the newest, are the youngest. If we look at these, uh, uh, the distribution of these signatures over geographical space, this is what we find. Um, if you, uh, I'm not going to uh, let you spend a lot of time on this, roughly, the oldest signatures, like these signatures, are uh, here in Africa. They are not elsewhere. <coughs> the newest signatures, like the Q, the purple, are, are here in, in the New World. The New World, the Americas, were, were, were populated uh, mo most recently about 15 to 20,000 years ago when humankind crossed the Bering Strait and went and populated uh, um, uh, the, the New World. So that's when the new world got populated. Most of the middle aged signatures, like here, the greens and the blacks and so on, are in the Asian region, in the Middle East and uh, Asia and European region. Now, this is consistent with the following uh, hypothesis. The hypothesis is no longer a hypothesis. Different lines of evidence have actually uh, provided consistent, uh, consistent uh, uh, inferences regarding this uh, particular hypothesis or provided. Uh, sufficient evidence in favor of this uh, hypothesis. The hypothesis being that we evolved in Africa, we moved out of Africa and went and peopled the New World uh, more recently after crossing the Bering Strait. But as we moved out of Africa, the first landmass that we actually occupied was the Asian region, and then we moved on and um, and and uh, peopled the New World. This is a uh, Y chromosomal patternally transmitted signatures. You can also get maternally transmitted signatures. It's exactly the same. The nomenclature is different because we are looking at uh, other kinds of signatures. Uh, it's not ABCD, but anyway, uh, other kinds of nomenclature has been used. But if you look at the distribution of these signatures over geographical space, you find exactly the same things. The oldest uh, signatures are in Africa. The newest signatures are in the New World. And the intermediate uh, uh, aged signatures are, are um, uh, in, in, in um, uh, Asia and, and Europe. So this is uh, uh, again consistent with the uh, with the theory that humankind arose in Africa, moved out of Africa, and uh, occupied different uh, regions of the world. The New World being the uh, the region that was occupied most recently uh, by humans. So uh, um, I said this before that we arose in Africa about 150,000 years ago, and uh, again I don't have the opportunity to explain what uh, anatomically modern humans mean. Uh, for one, uh, it means an increase in brain size. Uh, also, it means that we were less heavily built. We had a different uh, structure and gait uh, compared to our predecessors, compared to our ancestors. They, that enabled us to become more mobile, also enabled a higher amount of cognition and flexibility of cognition uh, in us, in the modern humans. And uh, like I said, we moved out of Africa and moved to different places at different points of time. We uh, explored different places, settled down um, in a place, and then our numbers increased. Then we needed to move to another place because there was pressure on natural resources. We were still hunter-gatherers, uh, pressure on natural resources. Therefore, we moved to another place, and so on and on uh, it went. Um, so this is, this is uh, the, the kind of 
human history over the last 150,000 years or so. When did we actually come out of Africa? We evolved in Africa about uh, 150,000 years ago. Uh, when did we come out of Africa? Why we came out of Africa, we would never know. Uh, the, the standard guess is that uh, there was a lot of uh, pressure on natural resources because we were exploiting nature for sustenance and therefore we needed to move and explore new geographical regions. But when did we move out? The best estimate is about 100,000 years ago. So we came out of Africa about 100,000 years ago and then by about uh, 20,000 years ago we had crossed all of the European and Asian land mass and moved into the new world and peopled the new world. <clears throat> when we came out of Africa, about 100,000 uh, 100, years ago, we were expecting pristine land, at least didn't expect to see hominids there. But we came out and saw that we were not alone. There were various kinds of uh, hominids uh, living there. And, uh, you know, they, they looked very similar to us, but not exactly like us. Um, and, and these were uh, multiple species. And I said that so far we've identified about 21 species. Not all of them were available outside of Africa, but a uh, um, large number of them. Um, like I said, that we are going to focus our attention on two separate species of humans. One that, that's called the Neanderthal, the other that's called the Denisovans. And the, and the battle that raged is that, why did the Neanderthals and the Denisovans vanish, become extinct. And that's where uh, semantic people comes in. All of this happened within the last 100,000 years. Um, so uh, when we came out of Africa, like I said, that we met at least, and those are the two cousins that we are going to concentrate on, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. We met uh, two other species of hominid cousins on the European landmass, uh, the Neanderthals, and then at a later point of time, in a cave in Siberia, a finger bone was found and that bone, uh, DNA was isolated from that bone, just as DNA was also isolated from Neanderthals. And uh, sequences, comparison of sequences of the finger bone from this particular cave, which is called the Denisova, uh, Denisova cave, and hence the name Denisova, uh, that DNA sequence was uh, um, not only distinct from the Neanderthal uh, DNA, but it just could not have arisen uh, from the same species. It was not like two different individuals of Neanderthals. The differences were far, far too many for, for us to conclude that they, were, they, were, they came from two different uh, individuals of the same species. No, they belong to two different species. Uh, again, I don't have the opportunity to show you the data in detail, but that's what it is. Uh, the data revealed that they, were, they came from two different species. So we came out of Africa and at least met two other species with whom we interacted, the Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans, and the interaction I will tell you uh, in, a, in a minute. Um, so that, that's what we did. The Neanderthals were uh, described as, a, were recognized as a separate hominin group um, more than 100 years ago. Again, based on fossil evidence, more than 100 years ago, we did not have the opportunity to uh, sequence DNA. Uh, the uh, Neanderthals also, of course, uh, all our ancestors existed in Africa. Neanderthals being our ancestors also, uh, uh, you know, existed in Africa, but they had come out of Africa much before us, probably about a half a million years ago, they came out of Africa and people Europe and Western Asia. So when we came out of Africa about 100,000 years ago, they were already resident in uh, Europe and uh, other parts of Asia. Um, yet we were able to somehow um, uh, you know, whether we exterminated them, we don't know, but that was the major theory that we actually killed them and exterminated them. Uh, they disappeared. The Neanderthals and the Denisovans disappeared sometime between 30 and 40,000 years ago. And uh, <clears throat> this is about the time when modern humans spread in large numbers outside of Europe and Near East. Again, from DNA evidence, you can estimate demographic expansions. Uh, the DNA contains a lot of information about various kinds of uh, historical events that have taken place. So we can estimate dem demographic est expansions and uh, it's now um, uh, established that humankind came out of Africa about 100,000 years ago. There was a major demographic expansion in Western Africa about 30, 40,000 years ago. Again, probably plentiful, plentiful food, uh, ability to procreate and uh, have uh, children survive that led to these demographic expansions. Um, but uh, the uh, concomitant with our expansion, the, the Denisovans and the, and the Neanderthals vanished. So the most charming hypothesis is that we beat them to death. 
and that's why they became extinct. Did that happen? We will uh, talk about it. So the history and relationship to more, of modern humans uh, to these two species, Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans, have been uh, sources of fascination and debate uh, by archaeologists and paleontologists. Um, but again, uh, the point, uh, well, paleontologists had not discovered uh, you know, the Denisovans, but at least between uh, Neanderthals and modern humans, there was a fascinating and uh, raging debate uh, in the in the uh, domains of uh, archaeology and paleontology, uh, so the most favored hypothesis was that we exterminated them. But at the same time, we need to remember that if we tried to exterminate them, we would have used stone tools. Uh, this is not to say that Neanderthals did not know how to use uh, stone tools. They also knew how to use stone tools. Uh, therefore. Uh, if if we used uh, tools to exterminate them, there would have been major battles between Neanderthals and Denisovans, uh, Neanderthals and modern humans. Um, the other is that you know Neanderthals uh, somehow um, what what happened was that um, the, the Neanderthals are direct ancestors of the present day Europeans, as uh, you know I already showed you in that branching tree. Uh, but then, uh, why did they, um, you know, become extinct? Uh, remain remain a major issue. This is where uh, Savante Pebo comes in. So all that I've said so far is essentially build up to what uh, uh, Savante Pebo was able to do. Um, and then, like I said, that he uh, contributed uh, in a major way to the genomes of extinct hominins and human evolution and inferences. You, uh, analyzing those, uh, uh, you know, um, genomes uh, to be able to draw inferences about human evolution, which is why he got the Nobel Prize. So this is uh, this is a cave in Croatia. Uh, Croatia is near the Adriatic, as this, this green portion is Croatia. So uh, in in a cave near uh, in in a cave called Vendeha in uh, Croatia, they they, they found a bone. Um, they found a, you know fragments of bones, and those bones belong to the <clears throat> Neanderthals and uh, uh, Simante Pebo was able to um, extract DNA from those bones, crush the bones. Uh, maybe there was bits of muscle uh, tissue still with the bones, but uh, they were able to uh, isolate DNA, extract DNA from the bones and sequence the bones. Uh, and that was the uh, first sequence of the Neanderthal genome uh, because these bones belong to the Neanderthals. There was no debate about the fact that these bones belong to the Neanderthals. The, um, and so when the DNA was, um, uh, you know, sequenced uh, from those, those bones, um, the, it, it, we had the first sequence of the Neanderthal um, genome. But the, uh, the sequences that were derived from, the DNA that was derived from the bones and the sequencing effort led to only fragmented DNA. We couldn't get the entire DNA uh, Neanderthal um, uh, genome. Um, the entire sequence of the Neanderthal genome. So they call their um, uh, public. Oops. Uh, uh, they call their publication as a draft sequence. So that was the draft sequence, primarily because it was not incomplete. Uh, it was fragmented, but it was very clear that the Neanderthals and the human, modern humans, were two different species. Um, what did uh, what did uh, Sivante Papebo contribute in terms of um, in terms of technology advances? So he made major technological advances. Um, the ancient DNA is usually damaged, and uh, Sivante Papebo was able to systematically study the nature, extent, and causes of damage in ancient DNA. Um, I will not not explain the whole thing because I think I'm running out of time. I will not explain the whole thing. Uh, very rapidly, what I'm going to say is that um, when you extract DNA, because of vagaries of nature especially, the DNA will be extracted in bits and pieces. And those bits and pieces are sequenced. Therefore, only short fragments can be sequenced. And uh, you, you can't sequence actually sequence the uh, DNA that you extract from a bone. You have to actually... Uh, make multiple copies of that using certain processes. Uh, that's called polymerase chain reaction uh, technology, for which uh, there was another a Nobel uh, award was presented to Carrie Mullis uh, in several years ago. Uh, so only short uh, fragments can be amplified, and then it's not 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 only that only short fragments can be amplified. Uh, there will be changes in the DNA in the in the alphabets. And there'll be an overrepresentation of some alphabets that you need to understand and correct for. So uh, again, uh, Sivante Pebo actually 
understood what the nature of those, uh, you know, uh, uh, preferential changes were that led to false uh, inference about certain kinds of nucleotides, and these needed to be corrected when you uh, assemble the DNA. Uh, there are also uh, other issues in terms of amplification of DNA. Like I just said, the DNA needed to be amplified, and there are certain modifications in the DNA that actually prevent uh, uh, amplification. So it's not easy. You need to overcome those modifications that obstruct the um, you know, elongation of the DNA uh, when 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 it's being amplified, and those those uh, hurdles needed to be overcome. Um, the uh, I've already said about these uh, uh, miscoding lesions that will uh, lead to incorrect base incorporation during sequencing. Now these in retrospect might seem simple. But when you are trying to isolate uh, ancient DNA and analyze those, um, it was not easy. Many people, there are, uh, the, the literature is flooded with sequences of ancient DNA that are completely wrong. Those are either sequences of uh, juxtaposition of multiple bacterial DNA or um, bacterial DNA mixed with human DNA, et cetera. People didn't realize. The sequences came from the sequencing machine and they thought that they were actually sequencing the ancient DNA. It was the insight of Cervante Pebo who actually figured out that that's not what's going, what's happening. We are actually not sequencing human DNA, uh, ancient DNA. We are actually uh, you know, sequencing contemporary bacteria, which are ancient. And therefore, if you compare ancient bacteria, uh, bacterial DNA with modern human DNA, of course, you are going to find that uh, you know those DNA molecules are ancient. But then you calibrate the dates and so on and so forth, you realize that something grossly wrong has happened. And then you try and identify what may have gone wrong. And you find misincorporation of bases, you find prevention of amplification, and therefore certain regions of the genome are not even amplified consistently across multiple ancient DNA uh, samples and so on and so forth. It was his insight into the process of this technology that actually led to the development of technology. And uh, again, I'm not, this is another slide that's, uh, <clears throat> I just said that there is a lot of contamination, right? The, the initial DNA, ancient DNA sequences are actually bacterial DNA sequences, nothing to do with ancient ancient humans. Uh, Pebo and his team painstakingly developed ultra-sensitive methods. Remember, you're going to get a very small speck of DNA of the ancient humans from this bone. Uh, and you then need to amplify, need, need to clean up, amplify, and so on and so forth. Horrendous task. It was very, very difficult. And um, you know, people had imagined that uh, they will come and uh, solve the riddle of uh, human evolution uh, pertaining to the, the relationship between Neanderthals and humans, but it wasn't easy. It took almost a decade or over a decade for Svante to be able to uh, perfect these technologies. Today, of course, it works in the hands of many, many people, but contamination, uh, you have to wear space suits because you know, you, you're you isolating uh, paleontological evidence and you sneeze. You put in your own DNA into that specimen. And then when you sequence, uh, you are going to get modern human DNA sequences, your own DNA. All of these needed to be perfected. The technology was horrendously difficult uh, to attain perfection, and he was able to do it. Then again, we have other kinds of things. You leave uh, in amino acids, and these amino acids will change. There is this what's called levo amino acids and dextro amino acids, and they will change from one form to another. And you need to correct for those, you need to understand the process, you need to understand what to what extent. Uh, uh, this kind of thing happens over a period of time, and you need to either make corrections or discard. Uh, again, I want to emphasize that all of these kinds of things were almost done throughout the, uh, you know, throughout all of us who have been uh, imagining that we will do all of these kinds of things. It was done almost single-handedly by Sebande Pebo and his team. People like us feared that we shouldn't even tread that territory because that's going to be almost impossible. And uh, many, many people uh, initially thought that uh, this man, Svante Pebo, was wasting his time trying to do all of these, perfect these technologies and make corrections and so on and so forth. But ultimately, um, he succeeded and that's why he got the Nobel Prize. What he was able to do, then do, and you can uh, conceptually understand that, uh, like I said, that if you look at humans, uh, they are 99.9% .9 similar, 
So these are these blue dots are uh, dots and stars or whatever dots and stars, circles and stars are positions where all humans are not uh, do not have the same uh, identical alphabet. So the circle is one alphabet, the star is another alphabet. So many of the humans in the first position have the same alphabet, but there is at least one human who has a different alphabet. So these are these are different kinds of uh, positions where these are called variable positions in the DNA. And there are about a 3 million of these variable positions. There are also some uh, red uh, squares and triangles that represent in one individual uh, each. And these, in, these uh, positions are a kind of constant across most of the individuals. So where do these come from? Or why are these individuals uh, uh, you know, different. It's quite possible that there was a de novo mutation, there was a de novo alteration at that point position, but what was discovered is that those red ones are inherited from some other species, and that species turned out to be the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are constant, have constant, uh, uh, that particular nucleotide across all Neanderthal genomes, and similarly, that red triangle uh, nucleotide across all nucleotide meaning alphabet across all Neanderthal genomes. So that red and the, uh, and the triangle actually came to a few individuals from Neanderthals. Now, how would uh, Neanderthal, uh, uh, the, the uh, alphabets that are specific to Neanderthals, specific in positions to the Neanderthals, how would they come to humans? They can only come to the humans if they interbreed. And they can, own that there is no, absolutely no other way, you might say that, independent evolution of these uh, uh, variant uh, alleles or variant positions, but uh, there were so many of them that it was almost impossible to account uh, for evolution of these new variants in the human line of descent de novo. So the mo most parsimonious explanation was that these have been derived from Neanderthals, and the only way to derive is if you mate with the Neanderthals and procreate. So that, and, and these, then you inherit certain portions of the Neanderthal genome, and the children will then be a juxtaposition of the human uh, genomic variants and Neanderthal variants. This was another observation that, again, Sivante Pebo and his team had done. And now we have signatures of Neanderthals. We have specific signatures of the Neanderthal genomes, and they can be assayed. You can assess those in the human genome. And as a matter of fact, you no longer have to sequence. The Neanderthal uh, uh, you know, uh, signatures have been embedded in microarrays. And so you can isolate uh, from uh, DNA from modern humans, run it on that microarray chip, and figure out uh, whether or not we have any Neanderthal genome. So life has become much more simple after having gone through all of these difficult terrain. And uh, you know, as he was crossing these difficult terrains, he was imagining developing methods, both uh, you know, in terms of technology as also in terms of data analysis. And um, uh, now he's made life so simple for us that we can, we can actually uh, get into this field uh, quite rapidly. Uh, so this, that was the draft uh, sequence of the Neanderthal genome. Um, and it was uh, also clear, uh, another thing was clear. So like I said, that you can get Neanderthal signatures into the human genome only by uh, exchange of mates or only by uh, procreation. The other is uh, a direction of gene flow. Uh, we found uh, Neanderthal genomes in human genomes, but human genomes were not found in any of the Neanderthal genomes that were sequenced. How would that happen? So it was a unidirectional gene flow from the Neanderthals to the humans. Again, the most parsimonious explanation is that of this is that if you had a Neanderthal parent and a, uh, and a modern human parent and they mated, they gave rise to certain children. If the children did not go back to the Neanderthals, then the Neanderthals would never get in the human genome. The, the children always went with the, with the modern humans for whatever reason. Maybe modern humans were more protective or whatever. And therefore, the, the direction of uh, gene flow that we see is only from the Neanderthals to the humans. Therefore, the, the, um, uh, you know, that, that sort of justifies my title. And again, I'm going to reinforce this. As we moved, we met, I, I, uh, we, we met other cousins. We embraced them. We embraced them so tightly that we actually procreated. And we absorbed the children into our community, did not let them go back to the other parents' community. So we, uh, um, uh, we moved. 
we em uh, we uh, embraced and we absorbed the genomes of the children, and that's that's what the story of human evolution is all about. Um, so that's that's the that's the reason why there is a unidirectional gene flow. That eventually eventually it led to the complete genome sequence of the Neanderthals, again from the Altai Mountains in uh, Siberia. Very interesting. This is Savante uh, Pebo. At some points, when you know when you are trying these things out, you get frustrated to the extent that you make these comments, and these comments have been made put down in writing. He has written about this. So he says that we'll never be able to sequence a nuclear genome of a Neanderthal. It's too degraded. So where, while he was trying to do this, he got frustrated and wrote this. Then he says that, you know, he uh, tried to extract DNA from a large mass of bones, etc. There's too little DNA there. It cannot be done. You cannot sequence the DNA. And then in 2015, uh, by, the by that time, he was successful. Uh, turn of the century, uh, about 2000, he was successful. Um, and then he writes this. That and this was a named lecture that he was giving at the Cold Spring Harbor um, at a Cold Spring Harbor symposium, and uh, he says that of course you should never say things like that, particularly in biology, because you'll often be overtaken by technical developments. And in in this particular case, Sabante Pabu actually was the uh, was the uh, uh, discoverer, inventor of these technological developments, and it's because of him that uh, we are now able to so easily, so rapidly understand how much of Neanderthal genome is there in, uh, in, for example, in my genome. It's very easy to figure that out because now it's been put on microarrays. Um, how many uh, human genomes have been sequenced so far? Uh, not human genome, Neanderthal genomes have been sequenced so far, about 8,000. Where have they come from? As you can see that most of them have come from Europe because that's where uh, you know, the bones are uh, preserved better and uh, sticking to the bones are little pieces of muscle that also gives rise to, uh, the, you know, DNA from which DNA can be extracted and therefore most of it comes from there. Uh, I talked about this particular cave, the Denisovan cave. Um, they were able to isolate uh, DNA from this one single bone uh, and, and, and uh, shown that it was a different species uh, because uh, it was an archaic hominin, which is different from modern humans which is different from the Neanderthal. So it was another uh, completely separate species. Again, uh, Sivante Pebo was, uh, was, was uh, the major player. I must also uh, give credit to another person whose name is David Reich. Um, he's uh, at the Broad Institute, MIT, that conglomerate. Uh, David Reich has also uh, contributed uh, you know, hugely uh, to this enterprise of sequencing archaic uh, ancient DNA, and the Denisovan DNA, the major credit goes to uh, David Reich. Um, okay, um, I, uh, I know that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to, I'm going to uh, move on. I mean, I, again, this is like movement, uh, tracing the movements among humans, but let me move on. Uh, let me uh, move on to um, uh, something, uh, something that we have done. Um, yeah, uh, I, I want to end my talk with uh, something that we have done. Again, in this particular thing, it's an interaction between archaic hominins and modern humans. So I talked about uh, the uh, Neanderthals mating with the humans, children going with the humans. Similarly, there is now indication, and honestly, there are only two Denisovan sequences available. But anyway, there's some amount of evidence that Denisovans mated with the modern humans and the children went with the modern humans. Uh, there was uni, uh, unilateral gene flow. Um, and uh, then uh, something very interesting happened. And this is a paper that appeared in Cell um, only three years ago or four years ago. Uh, there are multiple facets to this paper, but all that I want to point out is that um, about uh, the haplotypes are like signatures uh, or, uh, or a constellation of variants on the DNA. 25% of the cons those constellations identified um, uh, in the modern humans do not either match the Neanderthals or the, uh, or the Denisovan. So essentially what it means is that these signatures don't belong to us, even though they are in our genome, even though they are in our DNA, they don't belong to us. Timing is very different, timing of uh, these uh, signatures. 
Second, they don't belong to the Denisovans. They don't belong to the Neanderthals. So where do they belong? Where did they come from? So the idea is, or the hypothesis is that we must have, there were other species of hominids that we must have uh, mated with. And uh, those, um, you know, the, these 25% these, uh, of the uh, new signatures that we identified, those are from those species and the species are still unknown. So uh, we have mated with other species um, whose, uh, whose characteristic features are, uh, have not yet been identified. Um, we were also interested in these kinds of things as we were uh, recreating population structure of India and elsewhere, of Asia in general. Now, we uh, happened to work in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, and there are two major um, uh, tribal groups, two ancient tribal groups, uh, Jarwas and Ongis. Interestingly enough, I'm not going to explain this entire uh, picture. I will just verbally tell you because honestly, I'm running out of time, I know. Um, uh, so what we have found is that in the Jarva, in the uh, DNA se sequences of Jarvas and the Ongis, we find signatures that again did not belong to the Denisovans or did not belong to the Neanderthals. So we postulated that there was there must be other <coughs> species that the Jarvas and Ongis uh, uh, or or ancestors of Jarvas and Ongis had mated with, and the modern Jarvas and Ongis have those kinds of things. So the uh, uh, you know when 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 we actually submitted this paper, uh, nobody believed us. Uh, and it was uh, kind of hard to get this paper in print, but eventually uh, it, it was published in Nature Genetics. Uh, I'm not going to explain this figure. Concurrently with our finding, there was another group who was working in Melanesia, and they also concluded exactly the same thing. Um, and they, they, they uh, you know, presented their results in the uh, in a meeting of the American Society of Human Genetics. And these are tribals of Melanesia, and they also do, were doing genetic studies. And their genetic study revealed that ancient Melanesians actually interbred with a mysterious hominid. Again, multiple species of made, multiple interactions of humans with other species of uh, hominids. Uh, actually, uh, th these kinds of signatures are available in different regions of the world. Uh, we were interested in estimating the extent of uh, Neanderthal and Denisovan admixture in the modern human genomes of Asia. Uh, so we we actually did a large study in uh, various Asian populations. Uh, we had uh, uh, about 40 ethnic groups from India um, that we had uh, sampled and analyzed the DNA. Uh, and I'm we, of course, uh, this paper also has a lot of, um, you know, inferences about population structure, etc. But let me just present to you the question that we, uh, I'm, I'm addressing right now is that in the contemporary modern uh, genomes of modern humans, how much of Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA is uh, represented? So uh, if you, the, the uh, x-axis are uh, various uh, uh, tribal and caste populations of India, and the y-axis is the extent of um, Denisovan signatures present in the genomes of these people that represent these various caste and tribal populations. Overall, what we find is that Neanderthal admixture is about 2 to 2.5%. Uh, that's the extent of Neanderthal. Overall, if you look at the entire world, it's between 1% and 4%. In India, it's between 2% and 2.5%. If you look at Denisovan admixture, Denisovan admixture, is, by the way, is very little in India, but there is up to 10% of Denisovan admixture in uh, parts of uh, the Pacific Islands. Uh, so uh, Denisovans actually moved around quite a bit from Siberia to uh, through Southeast Asia to the Pacific and uh, Pacific Islands. But in India, they probably didn't en enter India very much. In India, what we find is that uh, Denisovan admixture is only about 0.2%. Um, um, but I also must uh, caution you that the number of DNA sequences available from the Denisovans is very small. Uh, on the other hand, the number of DNA sequences uh, available from the Neanderthals is about 8,000 today. Um, so we talked about Neanderthals mating with humans, Denisovans mating with humans, humans mating with other kinds of species. But what about mating between Neanderthals and Denisovans? Did the Neanderthals and Denisovans mate? The answer, again, it was found by Pebo and his group that uh, the Denisovans and the Neanderthals have met, uh, uh, did mate. And there's at least one uh, fossil. The blue is uh, Neanderthal genome and the red is uh, Denisovan genome. Of course, there are uh, you know, piece, small pieces of evidence that uh, there's some amount of uh, Denisovan genome, a Neanderthal genome in the Denisovan. But here it's 50-50, which essentially meant that this individual 
uh, is a product of a meeting between uh, uh, Denise Oman and Neanderthal. Uh, they were also able to figure out whether the Denise Oman was the father and the Neanderthal was the mother. They actually figured out, indeed, that was so. The Neanderthal was a mother and the Denise Oman was a father. Uh, modern genomic technologies uh, are so powerful that they uh, allow you to uh, make these kinds of inferences. My final slide. Um, what? So this is not just about population structure. As we inherited DNA from the Neanderthals and Denise Ovens, uh, we also have inherited uh, portions of DNA that might actually um, uh, correlate with disease risk with our uh, risk to other kinds of diseases. And this is, again, a paper from Savante Pebo, where he shows that the major genetic risk factor for severe COVID-19 is inherited from the Neanderthals. This is not the only, uh, only uh, contribution that he has made in understanding what the Neanderthals' uh, introgression into the human DNA has done in terms of you know, disease risk and so on. He's provided uh, multiple other kinds of evidence. I have picked this up because this is uh, uh, topical and contemporary. So um, uh, he, he actually, I'm not going to explain this. The, if you look at this uh, uh, figure, uh, the uh, figure 1A, and there's a sharp spike, and that spike actually is correlated or associated <coughs> with susceptibility to COVID-19. And if you look at where that spike, uh, the, the alphabet that uh, results in this spike of uh, susceptibility, where that has come from, you can trace it back to the Neanderthals. So essentially, that particular region of the genome that contains this alphabet that actually uh, enhances our susceptibility to severe COVID-19 has come from uh, the Neanderthals. Um, again, I'm not going to get into the details. Last slide. If that's the kind of uh, susceptibility to severe COVID-19, and that's come from the Neanderthals, what is the uh, spread of this particular uh, signature that enhances susceptibility to severe COVID-19. And lo and behold, you find that the highest prevalence of that particular signature is in India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, that particular region. As you can see, this red, red portion of that pie uh, is that signature that enhances uh, severe uh, risk to severe COVID-19. Unfortunate, but that's what it is. Um, so let me conclude uh, and, and justify my title one more time. <clears throat> we moved out of Africa. We met the Neanderthals, Nisovans, and possibly other species, hominid species. We em embraced, we embraced so tightly that we actually interbred with them and we absorbed. The children became a part of our community and did not go back to their community. So as they did not go back to their community over a period of time, our numbers increased relative to their numbers and over a period of time, their numbers started to decline because their children were not going back to them. And the result of, uh, of all of these demographic events would be extinction of uh, uh, the Neanderthals or the Denise Obans because their children were uh, the, the children of a mating between modern humans and Neanderthals was going with the, uh, with the modern humans and not with the Neanderthals. So over a period of time, there was demographic decline. There is now some amount of evidence to also show that there was a climatic change that climatic change uh, resulted in both demographic uh, uh, depression of uh, modern humans, but then the sizes of Neanderthals and Nisobans were also already quite small, and they probably could not make a comeback. Humans made a comeback because their demographic numbers were high. But again, uh, this uh, association with uh, climatic um, changes uh, during that 30, 40,000 year period is uh, that paper has just come out. And I think we need more evidence or, or uh, you know, we need uh, supplementary evidence in order to, um, uh, you know, provide supplementary evidence to that uh, uh, inference that has been made uh, relating to climate change with extinction of the uh, Neanderthals and the So um, I thank you very much for your patience. And uh, I think I've overshot my time by about four minutes. But uh, again, thank you very much for asking me to give this talk. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Parthamo Jumdar, for that wonderful exposition of this um, on this topic, which to people like me is very, very new with its exotic. Thank you very much. 
And now I invite questions. Please raise your hand. Um, so welcome, Professor Satyamurti. You are muted. Professor Satyamurti is muted. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, I just joined in the end when I got to hear Porto giving the executive summary. I hope to catch up on it by listening to his full talk on the YouTube. Uh, so I, I want to also thank on behalf of my own for his giving this beautiful lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Sati. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I really was looking forward to, but I was traveling. I just got up in the last minute. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Professor Partha uh, Majumdar ji. You have taken us back to 10 million, billion, 10 million years, sir. You started that, and it has been a pleasure to listen to you. We didn't know anything about what you have said. It is great that uh, uh, we have come from. 10 million billion years. Thank you, sir. Thank no, you. Not, not 10 million. Anyway, nice. Um, Maipalji, can you see other questions? No, Facebook? No, okay. No, ma'am. No, there is no. So, Mr. Dharamveer no, wants to. Uh, no, no. I want to, I, I want to ask the question. Uh, I Bully. I also want to ask questions. Oh, please, please, please carry on. go ahead. Who, 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 who you are? And Dua sir. Dua yes. Dua he gone? No, Professor. Tell you. Professor. No, no, no. Dua Professor. Dua, Dua, please. Uh, Professor Partha. Yes. Are you listening? It was a wonderful exposition. It was nice, and your last slide, last but one slide said. Of course, you should never say things like that, particularly in biology. Uh, of course, because you will often be overtaken by technical things. I wish uh, this particular thing happened 100 years back when the competitor of uh, President Nobel laureate Pabu, competitor that is linear, should have heard that who classified Homo sapiens based on the color green. Hmm? Yes, you, hmm. Like uh, Nigra in Africa no. and uh, like uh, Europeans different and different, which in the long run following 100 years or 80 to 90 years led to eugenics. And man based on racism, which led to racism and sexism. Totally, now it turns out to be totally wrong. Still, Linnaeus is worshipped as one of the biggest biologists in Sweden or Scandinavian countries. Which, in the in the view of present day presentation or present day, present year Nobel Prize, appears to be totally redundant and totally out of context. Going on the similar lines, we are also acknowledging that only the children were adopted by homo sapiens and they did not go back whereas this phenomenon itself is not going back or coming it is a sort of a you know the uh, period the mesmerization as sex is a gift sex is a presentation and entertainment but genetically meant for crossovers at this time, it is a little premature to say that male children did not go back to Genovisians or with the uh, Neanderthals. Probably. That's what I mean. So let's keep this open and say that one way crossover took place, which is as per the present day evidences, and the racism which led to eugenics was totally unscientific, illogic, and totally wrong. Any comment on that? So I, I would not like to, I agree with you that re racism um, uh, using, you know, DNA kinds of or genetic evidence uh, was wrong and uh, should certainly not have happened in human history. 
Uh, but let me let me let me point out to uh, what you said about keeping the um, you know uh, answer open. So we now have data on about eight thousand uh, Neanderthal sequences, and we have uh, you know data on over one hundred thousand uh, modern human sequences. Uh, so the question is that we have uh, beyond all doubt we have inherited from the inherited deep portions of our DNA from the Neanderthals. But why don't we find in all of the 8,000 Neanderthal sequences, um, uh, specific sequences that belong to the modern humans? The most parsimonious explanation of this is what I've just given. I can't think of any other kinds of explanation uh, other than, let's say, that they went back to the Neanderthals and the Neanderthals killed them, killed the children. That's another possibility. Yes, yes. Uh, that's another possibility. But, uh, you know, uh, killing children is something that we don't want to entertain. We don't think that that would have happened. Uh, the more more parsimonious or the more uh, humane uh, explanation of all of this would be that the children went with the humans. But again, like you said, that we can never be sure. Uh, you know, all of these empirical sciences, nothing is sure. Uh, we only try to make the best of uh, the evidence that we've accumulated, best inference from the evidence that we've accumulated. And that's the most parsimonious explanation of the one of the unidirectional gene flow that we uh, have identified from the Neanderthals to the humans, but not the vice versa. Yes, and moreover, this is on Y chromosome. That's no, 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 no. This is on the nuclear genome, not on the uh, Y chromosome. No, 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 not this. But beside COVID, there is a resistance. There is a immunity against so many diseases which are in uh, this part of the world, that is Asia, uh, than in US, in UK, in Europe or Middle East. Those may also be linked with other things also. COVID is a least of them. Some, some, some other diseases have been uh, linked uh, to Neanderthal inheritance. Um, but again, I mean, I did not have the time to uh, provide all of the gory details. Mm. My personal experience is that uh, one of the children in our family who lives in UK is an autistic child, but his genetic DNA, since we are biologists, we have got it from that it is, it is resistance to almost all these present day uh, viral diseases. So that must have also come or this mutation, which may be environmentally induced or uh, uh, Excellent use cannot be, of course. This usually happens in autistic children, which forms 3% of the total world population among children. And they are very good in few things, but at the same time, they get lost in the world so far as their memory is concerned. Yeah. And this gene flow is open gene flow. And sex is a reward for this gene flow. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank I wish you were like had had been heard by Linnaeus in 1850 in 1830 1840. There would not have been any racism. Very sad. Very sad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor Dua. Thank you, Professor Mojimdar. Now, um, Dr. Grover, please. Hey, Partha, you set up this institute some 12, 13 years ago. Okay, the field, as far as the Indian part of the study is concerned, is still widely open. And the things related to India or the Asian subcontinent, South Asia subcontinent, this has to be done Reflection. by the academia belonging to the Kuch. South Asian uh, community. So we have in most state universities of India, the departments of anthropology, departments of statistics, the department and also the geology where paleontology, etc., is done. But all these people have this challenging task in, in front of them, but they cannot make progress because this field, like any other current uh, frontiers of sciences, requires a lot of money and a lot of passion put together. You need technology as well as passion. So, now technology and passion, there is something that you could infuse in the new institution that you created. Would it be possible for you to create a consortium of these state university departments, present this as a project, 
where this thing should be studied for the South Asia by this consortium. And that was important from the contemporary context, not only diseases, but also have emotional integration of people which are a part of this region for a very long time. So our cultural evolution over the last 20, 30,000 years have evolved like our differences pertain to a very short span of, of the time that we have existed in this part culturally. So I think this study is important. This has lots of dividends in terms of us knowing ourselves and then infusing some sense of belonging, reducing the differences amongst ourselves. So if such a study would have benefits culturally, emotionally, politically, as well as uh, attending to the health solutions for this population. So I don't know whether I am making sense, but I would like to appeal to you and your colleagues who at uh, the institute that you set up to evolve a national program in which there is a consortium and larger academia who have interest in this are able to participate, even sharing of the scarce national resource, high technology that is needed. Thank you. So let me let me uh, respond to what you just said. Uh, what you said is extremely important. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, I'm, I'm pleased to inform you that there is a Genome India project that's actually happening right now. It's been funded by the Department of Biotechnology and it's being spearheaded by uh, two or three people, um, or two or three institutions, two or three people in two or three different institutions. One of them being a former PhD student of mine who has uh, you know, worked on uh, various kinds of evolutionary questions. Uh, his name is Anulabha Basu. He's one of the leaders of this Genome India project. That's a pan-India project. You wanted to go a step further, not just analyzing genomes, but also analyzing it um, in the context of their cultures, in the context of their susceptibility diseases, etc., that project is a major uh, undertaking, and I don't think the Genome India project is envisioning to bring in all of those kinds of things, perhaps passively but not actively. Uh, however, given that this particular project has been initiated uh, just about a few years ago, but the COVID intervened, and we are hoping that this project will provide us with a very deep insight into the population structure uh, of India because it's a pan-India project. The kind of studies that I have done uh, were more piecemeal uh, in the sense that, you know, I was trying to look at certain broad questions uh, uh, of human evolution in India, uh, but uh, this particular, and therefore the micro level things uh, I didn't even address, but this, the broad brush picture about evolution of humans in India is available from uh, studies that have been done by various people, including myself. Um, but this particular Genome India project is probably going to provide micro-level views of or micro-evolution of various kinds of populations. We will have to see until their uh, data are out and their data is based on um, uh, whole genome sequences of individuals that are drawn from these various populations. Thanks. So at least something is happening, uh, Professor Robert. Thank you very much. Can thank I, you. Yeah. Would you like to say? Well, uh, thank you very much for your excellent lecture. I want to ask one question. As travel is becoming easier for people to go from one place to another, marrying into different uh, uh, groups, Indians uh, themselves are marrying Bengalis, with North Indians, etc. How do you think population would become more or less the same, their DNA would eventually tend to become one, or the disparity between human beings will reduce. So what is what are your thoughts on it? So uh, essentially, what is going to happen is that these group boundaries are no longer are going to become fuzzy. Right now, the group boundaries are group boundaries because individuals within the group, they mate within the group, 
and they don't meet across outside of their group. That's the uh, historical uh, feature of our society, of the Indian society especially. But now, like you correctly pointed out, that there is a lot of meeting across groups. And therefore, what's going to happen is that the group boundaries are going to become fuzzy. The groups will need to be redefined. And ultimately, if there, there will be no um, you know, separate identities of these various groups. We are all going to become one. Diversity is going to increase. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the next question is on international Can I make myself clear? On, uh, on international level, Sorry. on international level, the travel uh -huh. has become much simpler. There is cross-country uh, mating and marrying. People are marrying from one race to another. So do you think any work has been done to forecast the future of humans, how would they look like? Species. Um, no, I don't think anybody. Is, uh, I don't think anybody will hazard a guess <laughs> at this time because uh, it's kind of risky. Uh, we don't know how how humans are going to evolve. Uh, also, that you know the kind of um, international travel has become easy, of course, but uh, the international meetings that's leading to viable offspring that's too, too few in number compared to the total uh, demographic uh, size of our population. So it might take a very long time for this marginalization to happen. And uh, so it's, it's too premature, I think, to uh, predict what's going to happen to the humans and how the humans are going to look like. Uh, <laughs> yes, no. No, no. <laughs> no, thank you very much. I just thought about it. I'm not a student of biology, so I thought I'll ask a very simple and straight question. No, no, but your, your, your question makes sense in, the, in terms of homogenization. So we'll become more homogeneous. There will not be group identities, uh, but even that process is going to take a long time. Okay, thank you very much. So now I request Dr. Raman Jushinder Day of INST Mohali to present a vote of thanks on behalf of all of us. Okay, the, good afternoon to all. So it's, uh, it's my pleasure and privilege uh, to give a vote of thanks and uh, attend the meeting uh, today. So I, on behalf of uh, INEAS, uh, INSA, and the, on behalf of organizer, uh, so we thank for this lecture series. Uh, first of all, first and foremost, uh, I extend my most sincere thanks to uh, Professor Parthapoti Mojumdar, so, uh, who is the National Science Chair, uh, Government of India, and distinguished professor and founder of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics, Palani, Emeritus Professor of Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, and Honorary Professor of Aizar Mohali, for uh, accepting our request to give the, give the today's uh, lecture. Uh, it was uh, nice to attend this lecture, and so many things I learned today. Thank you, sir, for accepting our uh, a request and give the today's lecture. Uh, next, I want to give my sincere thanks uh, uh, to the guest of honor, Dr. Giri Saini, Director General CSR uh, and CSR MTech, Honorary Professor of Punjab University. Uh, also, uh, guess our occasion. Uh, uh, and uh, then I want to give uh, my sincere thanks to uh, the organizer, uh, mainly. Uh, uh, from this uh, organizer side, uh, Professor Orun Gobar, the vice principal of uh, SPSTI, Professor uh, Kya Dharambir, Sri uh, Dharambir, uh, and uh, General Secretary of SPSTI for arranging this meeting. Arranging this meeting. Uh, several distinguished uh, uh, guests and attendees uh, like uh, Professor Kohli, Professor Gumnam, Professor Gairu, Professor Ruwa, uh, Professor Sundatta, Professor Guchait, uh, Professor Satyamurti, Professor Monoj Raji. So for attending uh, this lecture and uh, raise this occasion. And uh, last but not the least, uh, I want to give thanks uh, all these organizations uh, who are involved to arranging this lecture. Uh, first, SPSTI, uh, NASI, INSA, INEAS, IAPT, uh, PSCST uh, for uh, this kind of uh, uh, lecture series into the 2020. Um, and uh, thank you all of you for uh, one and all for uh, this lecture series. Hope we'll meet soon with a new lecture series. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Day. And
Yeah, please, please announce the next lecture. Our next lecture is on December 3. It is an expository lecture on Nobel Prize in Chemistry, which will be given by Dr. Anupam Bandopadhyay of IIT Roper. That lecture would be in partnership with Department of Chemistry of Punjab University, Chandigarh. Our guest of honor would be Professor K.K. Basin, who is the uh, secretary of the Chandigarh chapter of NASI and Emeritus Professor in the Department of Chemistry. The last lecture would be on 10th of December, the day Nobel Prizes would be handed over to the Nobel laureates of this year. And that will be given by Professor Mathili from Delhi. So guest of honor on December 10 would be Professor Arun Kumar, the noted economist of India who has been associated with our forum in a variety of ways ever since we launched these specific series of lectures covering all the Nobel Prizes three years ago. So thank you all for joining today and look forward to welcoming all of you on December 3 and December 10. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rohar sir, can I take a minute with you later? Yes, yes. I will. No, I'll talk to you on telephone then. Yeah. But we are meeting now, right? Yeah. We are yeah. meeting Professor Satyamurti at yes. lunch. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Thank you. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, all of you. Thank you, Professor Partha, once again.